Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the professor, and this is the moment of truth. For example, today the South African reminded us, uh, I put it somewhere, that um, Israel is going to need to end its occupation, withdraw its settlements, its illegal settlements and settlers, allow for the right of return of all Palestinian mm -hmm. refugees. I can't remember when the last time we've heard such clarity yeah. of, 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 of judgment to say, if you really want real peace, real peace, you have to address the root causes. And the root causes are occupation, illegal settlement, and the dispossessions of the Palestinians. And potentially even pay reparations yes. for all of that as Absolutely. well was, was also included. Now, you see what happened there, didn't you? Now, before we dive into this morning's briefing, I think I need to give a couple of necessary disclaimers off top. When it comes to certain issues that are getting a lot of attention from the white media, you have a number of black people who pay attention to it, and they start to feel some kind of way about it. Let me go ahead and say this is not about trying to take sides in the current wars going on over there in Gaza. There are no people who are over there who are stomping for black empowerment, and that being the case, they are welcome to have their war amongst themselves. We do not get involved in third-party disputes. That is something that we're actually going to have to get used to that idea. There are wars and conflicts going on all over the world. And when you got those that are involving black people, you don't see anybody going to The Hague or anybody else saying something needs to be done about it. It certainly doesn't get this level of attention. You can go ahead and look what happened in Sudan, whether it be North or South Sudan, what was happening to the people in Yemen, most of them being black, by the way. You don't see this kind of attention being devoted to it. That's one issue that I have with it. But another issue happens to be, if the South Africans are thinking that they're going to be heroes to somebody, that's the last thing that's going to happen. It should have been Arab countries that were leading the charge to call for a ceasefire in Gaza or to call for any sort of punitive measures against Israel. It should not have been the South Africans, but once again, you got some black folks who were basically trying to show that they recognize the humanity of all. And if we lived in a world where these kind of sentiments were reciprocated by other groups, then that would certainly make sense. But we don't live in that kind of world. And we have to be realistic about that. We live in a world where basically there are a lot of people who have sought to take advantage of black people all over the globe. So when you got some black person calling themselves, putting on the cape, that person does not look like some moral paragon. What they look like is a sucker. Because the very people who they're putting on the cape for have never and would never decide to be out there stomping for them. Now, let me go ahead and say, yes, I am well aware that there was some lip service paid to South Africa by Yasser Arafat back in the day. But keep in mind, the main reason he was talking about that was because he wanted to be able to bring some sort of comparison between what was going on with the Palestinians and South Africa. South Africa was getting more attention because of the efforts of foundational black Americans in the U.S., and that being the case, he had Yasser Arafat, who was trying to figure out, how can I get myself some of that shine? Let's be realistic here. You had not heard anything about South Africa before that or afterwards. And something else that I think needs to be said. You've had black people here in the United States who have been persecuted. We are the most persecuted people on planet Earth. And yet you haven't had the South Africans or anybody else saying there needs to be a case brought in the International Court of Justice on our behalf. Now, you had this Palestinian activist or this Palestinian commentator that you just saw in the video clip. And here he was talking about how great it was that South Africa was bringing up all these things. And the reason that I chose that clip in particular, and you can already guess why, is because you had that white anchor man. He was the one who brought up reparations. It wasn't even the Palestinian guy who did it. It was the white guy who said, and reparations. Oh, so all of a sudden, reparations isn't a scary word. Of course, it's never a scary word. If you're talking about reparations for Native Americans, the red ones, that is. If you're talking about reparations for Japanese Americans. If you're talking about reparations for various Eastern European ethnic groups from their own struggle and strife against each other. If you're talking about reparations for Jews or reparations for the Palestinians. That's all fine. You're not going to be having anybody saying, well, let's go ahead and have these articles saying there's no money there. That was a long time ago. Can you prove it? Who would it qualify to? They don't talk like that. They only bring up those kind of talking points against us. But with everybody else, they immediately jump on it. You don't even have to raise the issue yourself. They'll raise it. Oh, yeah, reparations. Oh, reparations has to go on the table. So as I've been saying for months now, for the black people who are out there, whose hearts happen to bleed for the Palestinians, I'm not telling you that it should or shouldn't. What I'm telling you is, there's a political reality here. And the reality is, no matter how the latest dust-up over there actually shakes out, it's not going to be in a way that's going to be benefiting any black people at all, not even the South Africans. 
And if you're going to be having African nations who have decided, let's bring court cases against Israel and the ICJ, it says a lot that the South Africans who received enormous support from us, they owed the end of apartheid to the support that they got from black people in the United States. And yet when it came time for them to reciprocate, what are they doing? They're looking at other people on the other side of the world. Common sense would tell you that black people in the United States would be the best political counter lever that you could have to any sort of settler colonialist influence. Common sense would tell you that. But unfortunately, when you have African and Caribbean groups, all these black groups from abroad, their jealousy of black Americans and what we've come to mean to the world has now metastasized into open contempt. They're willing to trip over their own shoelaces to file charges in the International Court of Justice on the behalf of the Palestinians. They're willing to risk the wrath of AIPAC and the American government, all for the Palestinians. But when it comes time for them to use that exact same ability to advocate for black Americans who did so much for them, crickets. That's the reason why I'm saying that there's really no good guys in this whole thing all around. This is a big problem that happens to go along with the concept of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism must be reciprocal. It simply doesn't work to have black people in the U.S. talking about stopping black oppression and deprivation in Africa when the people who run governments in Africa are not using their position and their ability that they have to speak as nation states to advocate on our behalf. And yet, here they are leading the charge for Palestine because they feel greater solidarity that they have more in common with them than they do with us. The Arab states were the ones who agreed to Trump's overtures that they should drop all concern for the Palestinians years back. The same Arab states who are now pulling up the rear and finally giving some insincere tough talk to the ICJ about Israel's brutality. These are the same governments who just four years ago were only too eager to normalize relations with Israel. They had no objection to the U.S. moving its embassy to Jerusalem, which basically declares to the world that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. These Arab states were also only too willing to join with Trump and and with Netanyahu, and washed their hands of even the weak, phony pretense that they put forward that they ever cared about the Palestinians. The Arab street may still be passionate about Palestine, but the Arab leaders are not. Let's be honest, when it comes to Arab governments, with the exceptions of Lebanon and Iran, who, by the way, are not even proper Arabs, they're more Persians, there's been no real support for the Palestinians by those Arab states. Some dissidents here and there, the occasional black sheep of the family oil baron or radical, but mostly they gave token gestures and lip service, but not much more than that. But now that the South Africans petitioned the ICJ successfully and kicked open the door and did all the heavy lifting, now we see the Arab street focusing its anger on its own leaders for not having said a word or lifted a finger to stop the brutality that Israel is carrying out. Why weren't the Arab states the ones leading the charge? Their own people know the answer to that. Why would these Arab leaders do anything for Palestine? Most of these tin-pot tyrants over there spend more time in Europe than they do in their own countries. As Dr. John Henry Clark said, you're much more likely to find those Arab leaders somewhere in France eating pork, drinking scotch, and patronizing European whores than you are to find them doing anything even remotely pious. Those Arab leaders threw Palestine overboard a generation ago. Even the Palestinian Authority had the ability to bring charges in the ICJ against Israel, but they didn't do anything either, and they are supposed to be the leaders of Palestine. But weeks now have passed since the South Africans did all the heavy lifting and got that unprecedented ruling against Israel. And now we see a handful of Arab leaders, having had pressure put on them, finally saying something. So here we are weeks after that ruling and the Arab leaders are crawling out of hiding, but only to give some sharp words just for the cameras. And we also see that the same Arab and Palestinian commentators who were frustrated and angry with the Arab governments for ignoring Palestine all these months are now cheering and applauding them. Oh, they've gotten over their anger at those do-nothing Arab leaders. They're all over it now. It's in the past now. And now these guys, they're all right. These Palestinian commentators didn't show much gratitude at all to the South Africans for the fact that they stuck their own necks out and risked the wrath of the United States. See, they were waiting to see what their own Arab kin would do, and now that the Arabs are at least making some token gestures, they're focusing everything on that, to go ahead and praise them. This is how this episode's actually going to play out. When negotiations between Israel and Hamas inevitably start, as they will have to sooner or later, even though Netanyahu would desperately like to drag the war out so he can get attention off of his own corruption and security failures from October 7th, when the negotiations finally begin, the Arab countries will want to be there for the cameras, but there will be no mention of the South Africans 
In fact, everybody will have forgotten all about them by then. Israel is unlikely to pay reparations at all, but if on the offhand miracle they do, it's not going to translate into Palestinians in the Middle East or in the U.S. advocating that we should get the reparations that we're owed. They won't see any similarity between their situation and ours at all. In fact, they'll do what they've usually done, which is to explain, well, that was a long time ago and black Americans, they don't work very hard, etc., etc. That's what they'll actually be doing. And the same white media who is psychopathically opposed to our reparations, you let the Israelis actually be made to pay out something, and the same white media will be white-splaining that, well, reparations to the Palestinians does make sense. Let's forget about that whole Hamas thing. Yeah, 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 this will be terrorist and all that, but you know, the, the, the situation is more nuanced than that, etc., etc. And the greatest perverse irony of all is that since the United States sends Israel billions of dollars of U.S. federal aid every year, if the Israelis actually do ever pay the Palestinians any reparations, it's going to be coming out of our tax dollars. The Israelis love to brag about how they have a robust tech sector, not that anybody would notice. They've got manufacturing among other industries, so that begs the question, why do they need the United States at all to foot the bill for their military? They have more than enough money to hear them tell it, more than enough money to pay the bill for their own security. But none of those questions will come up. It's just going to be past the money. If the Israelis do pay the Palestinians reparations, it's going to be coming out of our pockets. Or do you expect that the South Africans are going to go back to the ICJ to file suit against that? Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Frank Stocker. Kennell Bender, I. Wesley Jones, Black to Deaf, and Montrez Braxton. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.